When you play the Game of Thrones, you subscribe and like. Or you die. There is no middle ground. All right, hello YouTube. Welcome back to the Grease God View channel. Today's video, we're going to be continuing on our top 100 of Song of Ice and Fire characters, and we're going to be hitting number 99, being a Mance Raider. Very similar to last week, doing another Wildling character that's heavily involved in John's plotline. Mance Raider, to me, is a character that is a little bit above Egret. And the differences are, like, Egret to me is, is a character that we're more, more emotionally invested in, as she's with John Moore. It's the love interest, has a really not awesome, like, has an awesome death, as in it's a good death, but it's like, it's really a heart wrenching death. But Mance Raider, to me, the reason he is slightly higher up is Mance Raider, to me, has a more interesting backstory, as well as he's, I think, more impactful to the story at large than Egret is. And so we're going to kind of go through that in today's video. But I'm recording this video even before the Egret video comes out. So I hope you guys are enjoying this concept and all that. And... Yeah. Also, I wanted to take a chance to thank my Patreons and members for supporting me on the channel. If you did want to become one of those, you do get videos early and and better uh, connection to me if you wanted to like request videos or things or you had suggestions that you think would be good for me to cover. So thank you to them and let's get into the video. So I wanted to start today's video with a quote. This is from John asking Mance, is he a true king? And this is Mance's response. I've never had a crown on my head or sat my arse on a bloody throne, if that's what you're asking. My birth is as low as a man's can get. No septons ever smeared my head with oils. I don't own any castles, and my queen wears furs and amber, not silk and sapphires. I am my own champion, my own fool, and my own harp harpist. Now, this fully, to me, shows who Mance is as a person, right? All of the things we're going to talk about in today's video are more or less described in this one quote, because Mance is someone that, very similar to Egret, wants to be free. He's a big proponent of individuality. He is someone that doesn't want to conform to the Night's Watch and their rules, something we're going to talk about in this video. And it goes even further because Mance is someone that has united all these people, you know, a really big group of people. Not all of them are soldiers and things, but this just really giant army of people. And... Part of that's because he knows how to get along with people, but otherwise, other ways, it's because he garners respect. The people chose him to be their leader. And so he is someone that's very impressive because he unites all these people without having status or power, just based upon his own cleverness and how people look at him. And so all of that is perfectly exemplified in this first quote. So let's start off with Mance Raider's origins. Now, I think the funny part about Mance is that given how big of a character he is, we don't know where he was born, and we also don't know what year he was born. Whereas with Egret, we knew her age, or at least either she was 18 or 19, but we didn't really know where she lived. And Mance is even further from that. And Mance is somewhat similar to that, is that we don't know where he was born north of the wall. Like, we know he was born in a village north of the wall somewhere, we just don't know where. But we also don't know his age, and his age is very much up for debate. We have to put a couple things together to try and figure out a date, but given that when we look at the description of the character, by the time John meets him, his hair is kind of getting gray and things like that. So I would say that at the earliest, given book one, two, and three, I would say he's at least in his 40s, if not his 50s. That would place his birth anywhere around the year 243 AC to 258 AC. Again, placing him anywhere from that like 40 to 55, 60 range. That is where I think logically he was born at. There's also some other information we'll talk about later on as, again, Mance is seen by Ned Stark probably two different times and he looks completely different in both so that's something else we'll also have to kind of factor into this as well but again we know that he was born north of the wall which is interesting that means that he was a wildling according to Celise florent he was a child of a wildling woman and a man of the night's watch that's very interesting because that's a blending of two very different cultures being born of a wildling woman and a night's watchman what does that kind of remind you of Already, you know, it kind of gives you some similar parallels to Bale the Bard and his child, who, again, his child, if the stories are to be believed, was part Wildling and part Stark. 
you look at Jon Snow himself, who it seems like is either part Stark and part Targaryen or part Stark and part Dane. Again, two very different cultures blending. And so a lot of what we see with Mance is going to be placed into John. We think about how John's sympathies are. He's either the wildling side with kind of Egret and Mance, or he's also got, you know, his vows, his oaths, and things that he holds closer to his chest than someone like Mance. And so Mance is already set up to be a very interesting character just from that dynamic. And as we go further with the character, we're going to see there's even more to it. And so given that I made the Bale the Bard comparison, I do want to give a brief overview of that story as it is very important to Mance's character moving forward as we're going to see multiple events that Mance takes a lot of inspiration from this story. Now, again, I don't think this story was crafted by Mance. It would seem a little bit too on the nose. Again, we also know that Egret's mother told her of this story, so I would probably assume that this story was just either some fable that the wildlings have heard of, or it was something that actually maybe did happen, but just maybe the details got a little messed up, because some of the details don't particularly make a lot of sense, given what we hear about the story. But let's go through the story a little bit and all of that. Also, if you want me to go in more and also if you wanted to see the story covered in more in depth than kind of maybe some of the things that could affect on Winds of Winter, I did make a video on that last week. So feel free to check that out. But let's look at a brief overview of of the story of Bale the Bard. Bale was called a coward by the current Lord Stark at the time. So Bale, taking this, scaled the wall, disguised himself as a singer, and played for the Lord. He played so well, the Lord Stark said he could have anything, and Bale asked for a flower. Instead, Bale slept with his daughter, leaving the flower instead. The woman would become pregnant, and their son would eventually become the Lord of Winterfell. Bale, later in another venture, could not attack his son and was killed. So, again, you're going to see a lot of parallels between this character of Bale the Bard and Mance as we go forward in the story. So, I want you guys to keep that in the back of your mind because there's going to be about two different instances that are really going to heavily be influenced by this moment. But let's go back to Mance's origin story. So, at this point, he's living north of the Wall. We're not exactly sure what age he goes to the Night's Watch. Again, it's I'm assuming very young. Either he was, a, I don't know about a newborn, but I would say maybe being a, just a child. Anywhere from, like, Rickon's age of, like, three to, like, maybe six or seven. But at this point, a group of raiders was put to the sword. Mance was taken in by the Night's Watch. His last name seems to come from his origin. Again, they were a group of raiders. Mance Raider, they were killed. It's quite fascinating. Because that itself, was that created by Mance himself? Was that created from other people around Mance? We're just not completely sure. Because if it was created by Mance... It's quite interesting, because if it was created by Mance, you would have to assume Mance was old enough to know what happened here, and given his future events and wildling, you know, ties, I would assume he was old enough to remember this stuff, and maybe he created this name, maybe other Night's Watcher made the name, very similar to, like, John with Lord Snow, how others make that name for him, not him. That's all very interesting, but I think it's very fascinating to think about, why does Mance Raider desert the Wall? Think about this. His... Probably his family, people he knew, or friends would have been put to the sword in front of him. It just kind of leads to why he would desert from the Watch. But even if you're from the Watch point of view, why would the Watch even allow Mance? That seems unheard of for a Mance to join the Wall or the Watch. Is it because they're his father? was in the Watch, so they felt, okay, well, he has enough blood to be part of the Wall? I don't know, it's very interesting. Maybe they saw him as an innocent child that had nothing to do with whatever the Raiders did. That's possible as well. But either way, Mance would become a ranger of the Shadow Tower. Mance is often singing Bale the Bard after turning from rangings beyond the wall, which is also very curious, right? Mance is singing a tale, a wildling tale, it seems openly, to a lot of the people around him. I would love to see, like, what people's reactions were to Mance, right? Like, people seem to think that Mance was a very clever and brave person, but at the same time had a lot of wildling sympathies. He loved his women. It seems like he had a very interesting reputation. He reminds me a little bit of a character like Daron. Um, Daron being the one that goes with Sam in A Feast for Crows and ends up deserting at Bravos. Kind of reminds me a little bit of that character, but I think Mance had a little bit more substance to the character than someone like Daron. 
but I do find it an interesting comparison. But another thing I find interesting is given Mansa's ties to the Wildlings, it does make sense as to why he would be a good person to be a ranger, given that his father would have probably been a ranger. Also, he was a wildling, so he would be in a more accustomed to the area. Even if he was a child, you know, he would have been brought up in the harsh coldness, living in the wilderness. All of that kind of makes sense. The one thing I would question on that background is, given that Mance has these ties to the wildlings, why allow him or give him the opportunity to desert? And I guess that's maybe the watch in the wall putting faith in him. And it does seem like it pays off for a while. I, he, it seems like he is part of the watch for a good amount of time. And so I find that maybe they just saw that he wouldn't do that. Again, we have some flawed dating. We don't know exactly when this happens. But sometime between 286 and 288 AC, Lord Commander... Corgal? That's a rough name to pronounce. I don't know if I pronounced it right. Probably didn't. Didn't. He ends up traveling to Winterfell to meet with Lord Eddard Stark with Mance and a, and a couple other of the Black Brothers escorting him. So this is very interesting because given that this information happens, this is about, again, anywhere from 11 to like nine years before the main story started so again rob and john would have been extremely young at this point but we get an interesting moment where at winterfell he actually encounters the young rob stark and john snow playing a prank but promises not to tell on them which is interesting. It kind of shows how Mance is as a character. He seems more like a fun-loving kind of guy. He seem, Mance seems like a really cool guy to, like, hang out with. And so that just shows some of that. Um, it's also going to be something that, you know, Mance can use to connect with a character like John later on in the story. But it's also interesting to think that Mance had actually met Eddard. Now, if we go back to when we think, or I think, that Mance could have been at... How old Mance could have been at this age... Given what I have here, he would have either been, at the earliest, about 25 to 26, and at the latest, he could have been into his, like, his 40s. So, I think at this point, right, if we go off of where I think it's logical to point that he was at least in his 20s, mid to late 20s, or early 30s, maybe even into his late 30s, depending on what age you, you think, you have to point out here that Mance was kind of in the prime of his life at this point, right? So when we come back a couple of years later and Mance is maybe in his 40s, he's, you know, been living north of the wall for a long time, he's not going to look as nice and clean. That's why Ned is not going to recognize him. So we'll talk about that a little bit later on, but I think that's very interesting to think about. But also think about Rob and John, right? They've seen Mance as well and they don't recognize him either. But we have to skip a couple of years later. We don't know how many years passed between this moment of Mance's life and the next. I would think it'd be a couple. I don't think this is like a 10-year gap or anything. I think this is maybe like three or four years afterwards. But Mance was attacked by a shadow cat while ranging. He was healed by a wildling woman. Again, it's just, it's just to prove that the wildlings are not all bad. And they're willing to give a black brother help. Now, Mance also could have basically said that he was part with them he was a wildling like he he was part of their culture but this person also could have been someone that knew mance again i don't know how much i would put into that because mance very young unless mance was act actively interacting with the wildlings north of the wall when he went on these rangings that's all possible that's something we don't really consider too much is like was mance making any type of connections north of the wall while he was in the Night's Watch. That's something I don't think we consider too much. I don't know how much it's possible, given that, again, the Wildlings really don't like the Night's Watch, which is what makes this encounter with this wise woman's daughter very interesting. It does, like, poke up some questions about what Mance was doing during this time, directly before he goes and deserts. But it, again, at this point, it doesn't feel like Mance was looking to desert yet, right? Like, Mance might have liked the way of life that the Wildlings had, but it doesn't really feel like he goes over that line of, of leaving the watch until after this moment. But while he recuperated, she mended his torn cloak with swatches of red silk. Very important to understand about Mance as we'll go forward. This is a very important moment. 
But upon returning to the wall, Sir Dennis Malister, and this is the same Dennis Malister in the normal story, required Mans to replace his mended cloak with one of uniform black. Again, what is the one thing that we're going to come to understand with Mance? He's an individual. He likes to be his own person. And what does the watch do? It kind of strips you of your individuality, right? It takes you and says, okay, you're just a number, really, right? Like, your skills are this. So you're going to be placed into this group in which you're all basically going to have to be the same person, right? It's what it, That's what the watch does. It's like you... It doesn't completely do it right because people have their own personalities, but you're so limited by what you're able to do. And that's something that Mance is going to understand. You all have to dress the same. None of you can have any type of interaction with women, really. I mean, you guess you can have sex with them, but you're not supposed to have kids with them. You're not supposed to marry them, any of that type of stuff. You're not able to really have free time or like be able to have hobbies and things because of your duties. And so that's a lot of what Mance is seeing here. And Mance is really seeing how the wildlings are treated when they really don't deserve to be treated that way in a lot of ways. It's this way of that the both sides look at each other, where it's like the watch views the wildlings as savages beneath them, almost inhuman. And the wildlings, because of a lot of those interactions, treat the watch as these stone-cold killers and stuff like that, and that's not how all of them are. So you have these two groups of people that are completely different in culture and in their way of life, and that creates a really big divide between the two sides. But this infringement of freedom caused Mans to abandon the Shadow Tower and live with the free folk in the way he wished. Now, I have another question that I'd like to pose here. We're not told how Mans deserts. We're just told he does. Did he desert strategically? Like, did he wait till he was given another ranging assignment, and then did he desert then? That seems like the perfect time to desert. I kind of alluded to it earlier, but if you're Mance, it's the safest route, right? You go out on a ranging, maybe you're sent by yourself, maybe you're not, maybe you're sent with a group, and you go, okay, I'm going to go this way by yourself, and then you just don't come back. Or was it one of those things where he just had a lot of prestige, he had a lot of authority, he could have just easily have gotten out by himself, I don't think that's as possible. I mean, it is possible. It's very possible, but it's just not, it's not, it is safe. It's a much more risky option, in my opinion, to just stow away at night. So I'd love to hear what your guys' thoughts are on that. I like to think that given how clever Mance is, he would have just basically kept going like nothing changed. But then once he got his opportunity, he would have just left. And again, I, I wanted to just really hammer this home, given Mance's past and ties with the wildlings, but also when you look at his individuality that he's really focusing on it's really obvious as to why this happened but but that's going to lead us to basically what we're just talking about right like why did mance desert and we actually get a quote from john and corin talking about this so let's start with john why did he desert corin for a wench some say for a crown others would have it he liked women mance did and he was not a man whose knees bent easily that's true but it was more than that he loved the wild better than the wall it was in his blood he was wildling born taken as a child when some raiders were put to the sword when he left the shadow tower he was only going home again and that really kind of paints a certain picture here because i think corin on some things is right and other things is not exactly right like the whole idea that him liking the wild is in his blood doesn't really make sense to me. I think it's the way the wall treats people. The way they are stripped of a lot of the freedoms of the world, that is why Mance really liked the wild and north of the wall because he didn't have a lot of those. He, did, he didn't have a lot of restrictions when he was off maybe in a small party or by himself. They had more freedom, right? And so that's really, I think, what Mance looked at. And I think he looked at his people being north of the wall as well. So... I do think, like, yeah, he's right. He would not have just gone for a crown. That doesn't make any sense. That doesn't seem to be Mance the way he did it. Also, I don't think Mance leaving for a woman is right either. I think those are all just rumors and ways of painting Mance as a more simple person to understand when it isn't that simple at all. And it also leads to a bigger issue. If you go past those issues and you start going, oh, yeah, the reason he left is because of the watch. You got to also think, like, Mance didn't want to become part of the Night's Watch. He was someone that was taken from his family or his raiders, his family or his friends, and was just integrated into the society. What is this kid going to do when he's this young or whether he was a baby or whether he was a little child? What is he going to do? How is he? He can't survive by himself. Of course, he's going to go to the Night's Watch. So 
it, it brings up a lot of dark questions if you start going down that rabbit hole. If you're the Night's Watch questioning why Mance left, and you don't answer it with like one of the, the first two examples that Corrin brings up. But again, this leads us to a very kind of gray area. Um, we're told what Mance did, but not in a lot of detail. But at this point, all the way up from this point until book one, we know that Mance spends a lot of time rallying the wildlings under one force. And he did it in a number of ways, whether that was seeking uh, respect, whether that was winning a fight, whether it was talking sense into people, bringing them together. Man spent years gathering various tribes into one host, seeking support from clan mothers and magnars. He made peace between Harma Dog's Head and the Lord of Bones, the Hornfoots and the Night Runners, and the men of the Frozen Shore and the Ice River clans. Opposed by five other would be king be kings beyond the wall, Mance gained the support of Tormund of Ruddy Hall and Steer of Then, and slew the three rivals who refused to submit. Again, it shows the way Mance is able to cleverly deal with threats and to bring everyone together whether that's in combat or whether that's through peaceful talks think about the way mance even tries to deal with the night's watch with john mance at this point of the story think about in, in a storm of swords after the initial attack on the wall mance is going to win mance knows that but why throw more bodies at the wall to take it because that could you know he could lose a good amount of people doing that and he respects his people he wants his people to live why not try to do a peace talk with John and try to see if they can get safe passage because all they want is really safety, land, freedom for their people. And so that really right there explains as to why Mance does what he does in certain uh, ways. But also we get one other note before the main story happens. It is told that Mance is familiar with hiding places east of Long Lake from his secret expeditions into the north. So... This kind of tells you a lot because it tells you that Mance, given all these rangings, he knows a, really a lot about the deep north. He is able to, again, he was probably able to hide from the Night's Watch if they ever came coming for him because he knew so many secret areas and things like that. But that kind of gets us to our main story. So the main story, there's not a lot to really unpack about Mance in the first two books specifically because, again, the background is really Mance's life. We're really seeing like the coat hangers or the end of the life for Mance. Again, he isn't dead by any means, but we're seeing kind of the back parts of his life. We've already seen him in his prime. His life goal has already been achieved, right? Getting all these people together. Now they didn't take the wall and he, they didn't go how it was planned, but he is south of the wall again, just not under the right circumstances. So let's kind of go through what ends up happening in book one with Mance. There's not a lot to talk about, but Mance basically does what Bale the Bard does. He scales the wall, he takes on an identity of a, a singer, a bard, and he travels all the way to Winterfell. Now, something I find very interesting that's never really been answered. Mance Raider ends up coming to Winterfell because he wants to see what Robert Baratheon has become. He wants to see what the King's Party looks like and what also the State of the North looks like. How does he know this information? Given that it did take, like, I think a month or so for Robert's party to get up north, there would have been time for this information to spread. But how did it get to Mance? Did they capture some Night's Watchmen? Was that how? Was it a situation in which maybe he just had some spies that were south of the wall that heard it? It's possible. Even the journey itself, though, if you think about the journey it would have taken Mance to make it all the way to Winterfell, given he had to climb the wall and all these things, it would have taken, you know, a decent amount of time. So he must have found out about this very quickly. And so it poses the question that I would love to hear your guys' thoughts on. How did he know about this? I think it's a very interesting question. Now, we do know that there are deserters in the Night's Watch, given we see some in Book 1 with Osha. It's possible that they could have known about what was happening. I think the wall, again, would have been very informed what was going on. Benjen ends up coming to Winterfell for this event. So it's very likely that it could have just been some deserters, people they captured that tells Mance this, and Mance goes to figure out what's going on and to get really the, the look of what's going on in the realm. Now, why then do nobody recognize Mance? Well, let's think about it, right? The main story begins in 297 A.C., 
if we go off of the timeline that I've kind of proposed, at this point, Mance would either be about 55 or he'd be in like his mid 40s. And given the last time that Ned would have seen him would have been late 20s, mid 30s, anywhere in that range. That's a very different look, right? Like, especially when you also think about Mance was all dressed in black. He was living at the Night's Watch. He's not that anymore, right? Mance has completely changed his look. Being in, you know, living north of the wall will change someone. You've been in battles. You're more of a hardened veteran. You're an older man at this point. Your body has aged quite a lot. And so he's just going to look completely different. So nobody recognizes him. And so Mance is able to get the look of the future of Westeros, of what he has to prepare for when coming south. Because you've got to be thinking about it like this. When Mance is preparing to come south, at this point he has to be thinking that Ned is going to be right there helping the Watch per per protect the North. So, Mance actually gets the best of both worlds. When Ned dies, and also Rob goes south with all the forces, it gives, it gives wide open potential for the Wildlings to take the North, or at least not to actually take the North, because that's not really their goal, but to at least get south of the Wall. And so, that is kind of what Mance is trying to figure out, like, what was the state of the North at this point, and that's not where it's going to end up being when he actually does invade, but it's important to understand here. So, that kind of gets us to a Clash of Kings, and a Clash of Kings, it's kind of, again, more of this scouting, moving your forces, they're in kind of the Frost Fangs area, and again, not a lot of really happens until John ends up meeting up with Mance, that's the only other information we really have in a Clash of Kings that's relevant to the story, and we kind of see once again why Mance allows John to become part of the Night's Watch, or why he becomes part of the Wildling culture. Because John, in a lot of ways, is very similar to Mance. Mance can see himself in John. John was a cast out character because of a bastard, because he was a bastard, because of the ways he was treated, but also because his individuality is being stripped at the Night's Watch. Now, those are things that Mance is going to really relate to with John. And so Mance allows John to become part of the Wildling. Mance doesn't trust John right away, but it's at least he opens the door for John to become a Wildling. John also would be very valuable, given that he has stark blood, given that he has he's in the Night's Watch, so he would know so about their defenses and such. So it's kind of a roll of the dice for Mance, right? It's something where it's like you can use him, but also hopefully he actually is kind of trying to be a wildling. But at this point, he ends up going with Sturter's party as they go to scale the wall and attack Castle Black from the southern side. And that's kind of where we're going to leave Mance uh, with John's storyline at this point of the book. Because, again, this is a focus on Mance, not the Wildling story exactly. And, like, what, el what else is going on in the world? We're kind of specifically focusing on Mance. So, there's another part of this where Mance eventually actually gets to the Fist of the First Men and knows that the Night's Watch got attacked. And he actually was about to kill John, probably. But Egret saves his life. So, again... You have more there where Mance has given some signs that John is not very trustworthy towards their cause at this point, but he allows it again because he thinks that maybe John is becoming more of a wildling because Egret steps up for him. But Mance is not foolish, right? He tells Sturter if John steps out of line or anything like that, kill him. So it kind of paints Mance as a very clever and smart person, right? And so, at this point, the Wildlings just continue their journey south, the main bulk of the forces, and we see Mance basically test the Wall's defenses, sending the giants to break the gates, trying to send forces at the Watch. They nearly take the Wall, but they are forestalled for one attack, at least. And at this point, we get kind of a change, right, where... The wall is basically in disarray. They're not going to be able to probably survive another attack. And so John is sent to treat with them. Now, it's actually to assassinate Mance, but Mance at this point probably knew that already anyway. It's kind of suspicious you send John out to treat with them. The one that they know that they will have at least some more favor with, but also... It kind of feels like a super suicide mission because John has already betrayed the Wildlings and Mance and is the reason a lot of them actually probably died and why the castle hasn't fallen yet. And so Mance is left with an interesting decision. 
right? And he offers terms, like I talked about at the beginning of this video, of basically just trying to get his people south to stop the bloodshed and all of this. But before he can really go any further, Stannis attacks. Now Mansa's try to lead a defense, but it's too late. The wildlings are disorganized. They may have the numbers, but... This is Stannis, one of the greatest military commanders Westeros has ever seen, and they fall. And so all of this planning has seemed to go wrong. And that gets us to a dance with dragons. So Mance at this point has basically become a prisoner. Uh, also something else to note, during the battle, his wife was giving uh, birth to his son and she ends up dying. So Val is now kind of in control of his son. Now Val was the sister of his wife. And so I actually forgot to mention her, so sorry about that guys, but she doesn't really have a ton of character to work with outside of she's just Mance's lover um but at this Mance is in a rough spot we believe the audience anyway that Mance is going to be burned and then he actually does get burned now that's not what happens Mance gets some mel magic right and makes it look like he is the lord of bones and again it shows even more of Mance's prowess how john is not the best fighter like he's not the fighter he is in the show but he is still a very formidable fighter and Mance seems to really have a lot of strength, sh quickness, and for the most part, beats John in a fight. And so that's really important. That's a little bit of that foreshadowing of the, who Mance is, of who the actual Lord of Bones is, and it, that it is Mance. But Mance is basically sent on a mission. Mel has seen a vision of Arya struggling through the snow on a dying horse. We know it's not Arya. It's not even the fake Arya either. And so Mance is set out with a contingent of spearwives. But once again, he takes the bail the Bard approach. He ends up sneaking into Winterfell. His spearwives, along with him, help orchestrate some deaths. And they are basically forced Theon to try and help them get Arya out of the castle. And this doesn't go as planned. Jane, Jane Poole, or the fake Arya, alerts the guards of their presence. The Spearwives are probably all killed at this point. And Mance, well, we don't know. There's a pink letter that has been sent to John, but many in the community think that he either sent this letter, or maybe Ramsay sent this letter, or Stannis sent this letter, or whoever you think sent it. But the point of it is to understand is we don't know what's happened to Mance. Is Mance in this cage exposed to the elements? Is Mance the person sending this letter to try and get the Wildling army to come south to help free him, get him out of Winterfell? Because either way, he's going to be locked in Winterfell regardless. What is going on there? And that is the question that we have unanswered. Where will Mance go as a character? Is his fate in the story coming to an end will he be killed by the boltons or will he be killed because he's still alive when he shouldn't be will stannis realize this what is to come of mance raider the king beyond the wall and there you guys go thank you guys all for watching this mance raider video i was really excited to do this video because one thing i've noticed on this channel i don't I haven't really talked about mance raider too much on the channel at all and it's kind of weird given that he is a character that's still in the story and so, yeah, I was just, I just really weird that I've had this channel for, I believe, like two years now at this point, or at least close to it at this point. And we still have yet to do a really big Mance Raider video. And so I hope you guys all enjoyed this one. Let me know what you think about some of the questions I posed in today's video, and I'll see you guys all in the next one. Bye, guys.